Welcome back to the DC Day Swing Traders monthly Zoom meeting. You can find us on meetup.com. You can join Meetup for free, and then you search on DC Day Swing Traders, and you'll join our over 1,813 members. Uh, we have professional traders who have traded 30 years. We have intermediate traders. We have beginner traders. We welcome everyone, and we're delighted to have you join us today. We also trade stocks, options, ETFs, cryptos, futures, gasoline futures, you name it, Forex, we do it. We're also involved in all the latest topics, including artificial intelligence, quantum computing, hydrogen, electric vehicles, uh, all the electric vehicle charging, and all, you name it, we're involved in it. So we want to welcome you. Tonight, we have a very special guest. Our guest is Dr. David Cass. David's presentation is the outlook for the U.S. economy and the stock market. His discussion will focus on the role of interest rates and the S&P 500 over the past 100 years. David is a professor of finance at the University of Maryland. Previously, he was an economist with several U.S. government agencies. David has appeared on Bloomberg TV, CNBC, PBS Nightly Business Report, and Maryland Public Television, and has been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg News, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. So without further ado, take it away, Professor Cass. I mentioned at the Berkshire Annual Meeting, I, by the way, I've been attending Berkshire Hathaway Annual Meetings for about 15 years, and for many years, uh, pre-COVID, I would bring 10 students with me from the University of Maryland out to Omaha for the Berkshire Annual Meeting, which generally is the first weekend in May. I, I was out there again this year, a couple months ago. I went with a colleague instead of students, but I've been a long time attendee there. Anyway, my comments uh, then, and I think are very relevant now, at the Berkshire Annual Meeting, it's um, one that was in 2018, Warren Buffett mentioned that at age 11, he bought his first shares of stock on March 11th, 1942, which were three shares of City Service Preferred, which is an oil company, by the way, at $38 a share during World War II. And he said he was 11 years old at the time, as I mentioned. And at that time, the United States actually, as he mentioned at the annual meeting, was losing the war. And that did not in any way uh, dissuade him from investing whatever money he had. He then added that if someone had invested $10,000 in the S&P 500 index on that date, 1942, it would now in the year 2018, uh, be worth $51 million. I then took out my financial calculator and calculated that that implied a compounded annual return of 12%. You get those numbers. By contrast, a $10,000 investment in gold, a non-productive asset, would be worth only $400,000, not $51 million which again, with my financial calculator, I calculated a compounded annual rate of return of 5%, huge difference uh, between the two. I then went on to uh, mention a couple of things I already have with you here. And I would uh, ask Zoe, if you could please advance uh, two slides to a table that shows Berkshire's, it shows um, Berkshire's performance, no, uh, yeah, the table, that's it. Uh, here, this is Berkshire's performance um, in every year. And I'm gonna update, I have the updated current numbers for you. And this is actually my favorite chart, my favorite table. And I, when I teach in, in my classes at school, something that's readily available. And by the way, any one of you uh, could obtain 
uh, a copy of this updated table every year. Uh, this comes from, if you go to BerkshireHathaway.com, uh, Berkshire's website, and scroll down to Warren Buffett's letter to shareholders, and just scroll down to the latest one is 2022. Click on that, and literally the very first page will be this table. He updates this table every year for decades. What this table shows, I think, is fascinating. In this case, again, I have numbers through 2022. The table in the slides, I think, only goes back to 2016. Through 2022, the compounded annual return with dividends included for the S&P 500, the rightmost column, 9.9%. Uh, I'm taking the liberty of rounding that off to 10%. It's 9.9. Uh, the columns to the left, I'm going to ignore because that's Berkshire's performance relative to the S&P 500. And I'm not here tonight to talk about uh, Berkshire Hathaway, other than how it uh, does relate to what I'm discussing with uh, long-term investing in the S&P 500. Uh, but just to, for those who are curious, um, if you had invested in Berkshire Hathaway, what the table shows now, um, uh, the second, the middle column on this table is someone investing between 1965 and, 19, and 2022, 58 year period, which is shown here. Yeah, as I said, the S&P 500 with dividends included, you would uh, on a compounded rate or have earned 9.9% uh, with uh, Berkshire. 19.8%. So therefore, S&P 500, 10% compounded, Berkshire, 20% compounded, which might explain why Warren Buffett is one of the richest uh, people in the world. But I'm focusing on the S&P 500, not Berkshire. Looking at this table, it is very interesting. And one conclusion, by the way, I look back at data Going back to 1942, the year Warren Buffett made his first investment at age 11. From nine, that's 80 years, from 1942 to 2022. I looked at the S&P 500 return with dividends and cools. That's total return. In 80% of the 80 years, the S&P 500 with dividends included at a positive return. In only 20% of those years was the return negative. Looking at the table that you have up, we have up on the screen, there's only one, and, and, and by the way, those numbers are consistent, the 20% roughly number, 80% is consistent with the numbers from 1965 through 2022. In fact, only 19% of the years in the market go down but I'll say 20%. Looking at this table, there's only one time period on this table, which is 50, up in front of me, the updated version is 58 years. Only one time period did the S&P 500 with dividends included go down three years in a row. Only once in 58 years. And that was the year 2000, 2001, 2002 and that we have the dot-com bubble largely being the explanation of that. There's only one other time period that the S&P 500, with dividends included, went down two years in a row. Only one other time, 1973, 1974. And that was, we had an oil embargo, a Middle East war, the price of oil quadrupled, as I remember, the price of oil uh, before the problem was selling at $3 a barrel and went all the way up to 12. And of course, today it's something like $75 a barrel. But back then it went from $3 up to 12. It quadrupled and caused major, major economic problems. Um, and that was reflected certainly in the financial markets uh, at that time. So a very consistent path of investing with the S&P 500. Um, and in terms of uh, my, uh, looking at this table as well, 
On only one occasion did the S&P 500 decline by at least 30%. That was 2008. Uh, it declined by 37%. That was the Great Recession and Financial Crisis. Uh, the market has declined in only two other occasion, occasions at this time period, at least 20% in 1974 and 2002. By contrast, the S&P 500 rose by at least 30% on nine occasions over this 58-year period and rose by at least 20% on 10 other occasions over this 58-year period. Um, then I, uh, let me see what price. And I guess we could um, advance to the next slide, S&P 500 uh, performance, uh, 1927 to present, next couple of slides. Um, Yes, that's good. And you see it's uh, doing fairly well. Again, this is going through the year 2018 uh, and 28 through the next one showing similar performance. And uh, okay, on this slide, S&P historical price earnings ratio um, and a question here, uh, would be one evaluation uh, looking at it today uh, versus its history. And I know today, again, this goes to 2018, it appears the S&P 500 is actually slightly or somewhat above historical averages. I, I think the forward S&P 500 PE is something like 19 today and historically, maybe 15 to 16 has been the historical average. So it's a little bit on the high side, uh, but not excessive uh, in my opinion. Uh, and in terms of concern about uh, recessions, um, virtually every, and of course there was a lot of concern about uh, whether we'd have a recession this year, and there still is, uh, that has not gone away. But earlier uh, in the year, almost every, um, so-called expert, major Wall Street firms, uh, Wall Street economists, academics as well, uh, were predicting uh, a recession probably sometime this year. And so far, um, we really haven't seen one. Um, and virtually every recession since World War II was preceded by the Federal Reserve raising interest rates too far, too fast from a high level from a higher level than we started this year. Now this year, uh, the, uh, the Great Recession of 2008 uh, had an additional contributing factor. Um, you know, there was too much debt in, in the housing sector, um, which certainly there was subprime mortgages, et cetera, uh, and collapsing in the market, which contributed greatly to that recession. But we have this year in terms of the recession and the interest rates starting with March of 2022, we were essentially the federal funds rate was between zero and one quarter of 1%, essentially zero. Uh, between March uh, of 2022 and I guess May, April, May 2023, a little more than a year, uh, the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates by. Uh, 500 basis points, five full percentage points. We've gone essentially from zero to 5%, which we now five, five and a quarter. Next week, the Federal the Open Market Committee meets and virtually everyone expects the Federal Reserve to raise the Federal Funds rate by a quarter of a point uh, next week. Uh, Jay Powell, the chairman, has signaled that as have other governors. Um, it'll be a shock if that does not happen. And the latest numbers, uh, one set of numbers I always look at, and I have the latest numbers in front of me, every three months, there are economic projections um, that are published by the Federal Reserve. The last 
one being issued uh, June 14th of this year. Next one will be due in September. Uh, showing their projections of interest rates, and they are projecting as of June two more uh, one quarter percent uh, increases of pro funds rate by the end of the year. So they're projecting we go from five percent to from five to five and a quarter a range up to five and a half to five and three quarters by the end of the year. And then their projections for 2024. So they take the midpoint between five and a half and five and three quarters, and they call it 5.6 in their projections. For year-end 2024, they're showing 4.6. And for year-end 2025, they're showing 3.4. So they're projecting, they expect to be cutting interest rates in 2024, four times, let's say, by a quarter point each, uh, one full percentage point in 2024. And they're projecting in 2025, oh, similar. In fact, there are one and a quarter percent uh, decline. And then their longer run projection for the federal funds rate. So I assume that means 2026 and further out is at 2.5%, yet another full percentage point drop. So the outlook, once we get past uh, next week, which is virtually certain to be a quarter point increase, and another one, some likely, but not necessarily, not necessary. Uh, quarter point sometime uh, later this year, um, then actual cuts are expected later. The Federal Reserve is hoping for, you know, Janet Yellen, as Secretary of the Treasury, has indicated uh, that they're certainly hoping for a soft landing, that is to bring inflation down. And of course, inflation is the problem. The reason we're raising interest rates is to get inflation down. Uh, the CPI a year ago was at about 9%, down to 3% low. The Federal Reserve prefers to look at uh, core PCE, uh, personal consumption expenditure, core, core meaning being without food and energy. And their project and their goal, the target is 2%. The core PCE from, again, their June 14th projection is they'll have core PCE, which is now, I think, at 4.8%, is to bring it down to 3.9% by the end of this year to 2.6% by the end of 2024 and to 2.2% by the end of 2025. Now, that's also over a time period that they're lowering interest rates. So what they're implying in their uh, projections is they're willing to cut interest rates and federal funds before, before core PCE hits their target of 2%. So what they're apparently are showing here is that once core gets under 3%, but moving in the right direction and declining, that they are likely to be cutting interest rates as well. And of course, uh, my main argument of my projection, my observation over decades, of being a conservative investor, not a trader. Conservative, a long-term investor, and stock prices certainly move inversely uh, to interest rates. And Warren Buffett, uh, one of his uh, very famous uh, quotes um, that he's used many times, um, interest rates are to asset prices as gravity is to matter. So think of gravity to matter. Uh, when interest rates go down to zero, think of our astronauts in space. There's no gravity. They're floating. They go up. As interest rates go down to zero, uh, asset prices, not just stocks, asset prices, financial asset prices go up. And that's his uh, main tenet. Uh, he has made that quote many times. Again, the inverse relationship uh, between interest rates and asset prices. Um, and uh, let me uh, also say a couple of, again, I'm looking at my notes now from five years ago in my uh, presentation. Um, 
It's also interesting to know that yes, the price earnings ratio for the S&P 500 of using earnings one year projection, one year projection is about 19. But right now, the price earnings ratio for money market funds, or if we have an investment now paying 5%, if someone has an investment, say, in a money market fund or a CD paying 5%, your price earnings ratio there is effectively 20, 20 to 1. Uh, if you have a long term, Treasury is 30 year treasuries until recently, uh, yielding now 3.8%, I believe, even you round that up to 4%, they're selling for, you can think of that as 25 times earnings without any prospect for growth, you're getting a fixed payment where stocks of course have a uh, um, growth potential as our economy has grown over time. Uh, I think if, as we go through our slides, if Zoe could please uh, go through the slides here. This is an interesting slide that presented the 10-year Treasury rate, uh, 1962. Here's that quote from Buffett that I just mentioned. Uh, it illustrates that asset prices of gravity is to the apple. That's another way of putting it. When there are low interest rates, there's very low gravitational pull on asset prices. Um, that's in the way that he has put it. Uh, then the 10 year Treasury rate, 1962, the price, you see it's been coming down. Interest rates have been coming down over time uh, from 1982. From 1982, uh, pretty much right through 2022, uh, we had a 40 year period. They got a little blip maybe around 2008, but uh, we had a 40 year period. Uh, back in 1980, I don't know how many of you uh, were trading or active or focusing on financial markets or even around at that time, for those of you who are younger. Um, in 1980, uh, we had double-digit uh, interest rates. You had long-term treasuries, as I recall, I think something like 15%. Short-term treasury bills, 13, 12, 13 percent. Of course, inflation was around 10 percent. So you had double-digit inflation. So your actual real returns at that time may have been just two or three percent. But if you bought a long-term treasury, a 30-year treasury, paying 15 percent or something close to it, you're going to get that yield for 30 years or 20 years. As inflation subsequently came down, Paul Volcker became chairman of the Fed in 1979, and he was determined to get double-digit inflation down to, say, normal levels. And he stepped on the brake and basically induced a very severe recession in 1981-82. And interest rates were going straight down through 2022. And then, of course, the past year, uh, cost of inflation, uh, and cost of the pandemic, uh, both the Federal Reserve and Congress, both administrations, uh, Republican and Democratic, stimulated the economy, as I think we had to do uh, to get the economy to somehow survive when we were all shut down with COVID, uh, a once in a century event to try to get us through until uh, uh, we did, um, until uh, we were able to recover from it and things uh, getting back to uh, normal levels. Um, all right, if we go through a few more slides, Zoe would please uh, move on. 30 year Treasury rate, uh, 1977, a similar picture, interest rates coming way down. This is through the year 2018, a similar picture if we project through the current time. Right, thank you, uh, Zoe. Uh, next slide, please. Inflation levels, uh, all IM CPI index. All right, this CPI historical average, if we look at the lower part of the slide, 1913 through present, present being 2018, 3.24%, uh, 1970 to the present, 4.07, 2018, 
it picked up this double digit uh, inflation of the early 80s, 1979, 80, 81. So that sort of bumped it up to about 4%, but inflation, CPI has been in the three and a half to 4% range historically. Um, and we're pretty close to that now, overall CPI uh, not looking at the core. So we can go further, uh, Zoe, please. Uh, and US inflation rate, 1918 through 2018, I guess that was 100 years that I was looking at, and it uh, it moves around. You see the bump up in 1980. You see it gets above 10%. Uh, you see that double digit, you're up to 10, 11, 12% around 1980. Um, and then it looks like uh, coming out of World War II, looks like, it's like 20% inflation. Uh, coming out of World War II, and then going way back to 1920, but things were booming there, and then you could see things come sharply down, all, all the way down. I guess that's the stock market crash and a bad things happening uh, um, soon thereafter, and we're having deflation, the negative, negative inflation is deflation, and you see that through the 1930s with the Great Depression. We, we don't return to positive inflation until 1940. And what gets us out of it is World War II. Uh, getting uh, brought into World War II in 1941, uh, that's actually stimulated the economy and got us out of the Great Depression, to a large extent, got us out of the Great Depression. Um, and uh, so the war actually, uh, Served that uh, macroeconomic uh, impact. Okay, the next slide, please. Um, yeah, U.S. inflation rate uh, again showing this two, three, four percent. Uh, and the next after that. All right, corporate earnings growth, after-tax corporate profits, annual growth, uh, 1970 to the present, again, that's 2018, 8.3%, very healthy, as I mentioned, uh, a secondary contributing factor to valuation of equities, stocks, is uh, profits, uh, growth in profits, uh, interest rates. Interest rates, you may think of them as having a major contributing factor in, into, let's say, a, a level of price earnings ratio level and growth would add to it, um, to that or add to now the price earnings ratio, certainly adding to the numerator um, going forward, uh, earning to the uh, denominator with earnings. Uh, and then the price of the stock would go up accordingly for a given price earnings ratio. The next slide, please. And corporate earnings, 1950 to the present, you see the United States economy is quite healthy, uh, certainly post-World War II, and we're on the steady uh, increase, uh, doing quite well. It's the nature of our capitalist economy uh, Warren Buffett has said, "Don't bet, bet, don't bet against the United States. Don't bet against our our economic system." And this, I think, is an example of why he might say that. Next slide, please. Again, corporate earnings uh, going up in more recent years. Now we can go to the next slide. This is just the growth rate, could be erratic year to year, but generally positive. Now we do have every 10 years a recession of some sort. A recession, we have a recession, uh, profits will come down. It uh, could be negative for a year or two, but notice, Overwhelmingly, 
we're above the x-axis with the positive growth, but it could change a fair amount year to year, depending where we are in an economic cycle. Okay, next slide, please. All right, this was a discussion that I had that was more relevant then. In 2018, we had a tax cut that was passed in December of 2017 taking effect in 2018, cutting the corporate tax rate from 35% uh, to 21%. So one argument, again, I'll, I was the bull in this bull bear debate at the time. One additional argument I was making that should certainly add to uh, corporate profits, which should indeed uh, add to uh, share prices as a result of that tax rate, the uh, tax cut. All right, next slide, please. Um, and that just shows the corporate tax rate coming down. It was much higher in earlier years, uh, and, it's, and there was a tax cut in 1986. You can see the corporate tax rate, if we go back to 1950s, the 19, early 60s, uh, in the 60s, the corporate tax rate was over 50%. Then in uh, 1986, it came down to around the 35% level. And then uh, in 2017, it comes down to 21%. Again, this would be beneficial uh, for investments in stocks, equities, and corporate profits. All right, next slide, please. Closing remarks. Okay, I'm supposed to say something. Okay, so let me uh, close. I'll make some concluding comments. Um, and, and oh, yes, here's a picture with my hero, Warren Buffett. Uh, let me explain where this picture came from. Um, that um, when I was at University of Maryland, I had a student uh, way back in 2005 who managed to get invited on his own initiative, a junior, undergraduate, a junior, who managed to, he wrote Warren Buffett and asked Warren Buffett if he would meet with students privately. And 2005 was the first year that Warren Buffett agreed to do that, not only with University of Maryland students, but with students at other universities. I think he met with students from 15 different universities that year. Then in subsequent years, uh, he would meet with students, uh, I was invited back. I was the contact between Warren Buffett's office and the uh, University of Maryland. And every three years, I was on a wait list. Every three years, I'd be invited, bring 20 students with me out to Omaha for a private meeting with Warren Buffett. And what he would do uh, at, the, at these meetings, he would invite, um, 20 students from eight different schools at a time, so it's 160 students, five times during the year. So he's meeting with students from 40 different schools over the year, uh, over the year, and he would answer student questions, take us to lunch, and pose for pictures. And this is my picture, I think, from the year 2011, I believe it was when this picture was taken. Each of us got our own individual pictures. He stopped doing it in 2016. I guess his age may be catching up with him. Uh, as again, he's now 92. Uh, so he, he started, uh, but he loves students. And he, he said he wasn't a portfolio manager or running a business. The second choice of his career would have been uh, as an academic. He, he loves to teach. Then, um, my one concluding statement I made at the presentation five years ago, which I'll make now, and then I'm going to throw out a question to you. I know many of you may have questions for me, and I'm happy to answer every one of your questions. And but before I, but let me give you this concluding statement, and then I'm going to throw out a question to each of you. Uh, but, but my my uh, concluding statement. And this comes from a recent uh, Warren Buffett letter to shareholders, an annual report. And this is my concluding statement. Warren Buffett has stated that when he's no longer here, his wife should invest 90% of 
for financial assets in a low cost S&P 500 index fund, such as that offered by Vanguard. He actually mentions the word Vanguard in his uh, letter to shareholders. And the remaining 10% in short-term treasuries to cover any need she may have for liquidity. Those are virtually verbatim words uh, from a recent Warren Buffett letter to shareholders. And, and that's um, my advice in general. I'm sort of uh, with myself following similar, well, I, each of us has our own way of investing whatever money we may have. But my challenge to you, and again, I'm, I'm sort of finishing my discussion now, and I certainly welcome questions from all of you. I'll try my best to answer them. But I have one question for you. One, I know many of you, you sound, many of you sound really very sophisticated in terms of trading. Uh, um, and I have very, I don't trade, so I'm a long-term investor. In fact, when I sell something soon after I buy it, uh, what does happen once in a while, it's because I realize they made a mistake. Uh-oh, bad news came out. I didn't expect this to happen. I better sell it now. And it's starting to go down. I don't want to go down any further. Um, that happens once in a while. But generally, I, I will have a long time horizon. My question to each of you, and none of you have to answer at all. It's a, this is a question sort of for you to think about. I, I don't, I'm not expecting any one of you to give me an answer. I'm just sort of challenging you to think about it. Um, and my question is, many of you, it appears that many of you uh, spend enormous amount of time, and I have enormous respect for you for putting in this time, effort, and all of you sound very highly intelligent, very knowledgeable in what you're doing. And I hope all of you are making money doing this. I hope this is all profitable for every one of you. But my question to you is, to each one of you, have you or do you ever or have you in the past at the end of a given calendar year? And I realize that if you're a frequent trader, you have zillions of transactions, lots of them. But at the end of the year, and I hope again, every one of you has a profit at the end of the year. But have you calculated your annual rate of return and compared it? to the S&P 500 index with dividends included that year. And if you have, have you compared your performance over one, three, and five years? I'll stop at five years. One, three, and five years. How have you done versus the S&P 500? I mention this to you because very, very few portfolio managers, manage, well-known, portfolio managers, people who will get interviewed on CNBC, Bloomberg, et cetera, only a very small percentage, maybe 15%, will outperform the S&P 500 index over, say, a five-year period, or even uh, a three-year period. A very small percentage. Some do. Some do, and those who do. But very few do consistently. I mentioned this to you, many of you do this, this you love, I'm, you're doing it because you love what you're doing. And for many of you, not only is it profitable, but I'm sure it's entertaining uh, and you just love what you're doing. And I, I don't want to discourage any of you from doing whatever it is you're doing. Um, now, each of us is different. We each have our own degree of our own unique risk aversion. I mentioned whenever I give a talk, each of us, what's right for one person, whether you put 90% in S&P 500 or 50% or what, you know, you want to be able to sleep at night, et cetera. Each of you is different, but I, I really challenge you if you haven't done it until now to do a, a calculation, if you could. It's probably very complicated if you're doing a zillion transactions a year uh, to see if you're outperforming the S&P 500. And I'm willing to guess, I'm willing to bet no money, no money in this bet, just a verbal bet that I would I would guess that let's say at least 80% of you, and this is a good group, I think you're very smart, 80% of you 
over say a one, three, five year, I'll say over a five year period uh, are not outperforming the S&P 500. I hope I'm wrong. I hope you're doing better than that. But I mention it to you. And the reason I'm mentioning it to you is now if it turns out that you're not outperforming the S&P 500 and there are other things you would rather do with your time, it's up to each individual, you might consider, uh, for example, investing at least part of your investments or a larger part of your investments in an S&P 500 index fund. I mentioned this to you because I've asked several friends when I come across very people experience of, who've been investing for many years, I asked them that question. I said, how are you doing versus the S&P 500? Was anyone can uh, invest in a low cost? Let's say with Vanguard, you have $1,000. That's, I think, maybe a minimum investment required or a few thousand. Uh, anyone could do that with little effort. And I get these blank stares looking at me like, what are you talking about? And these are very smart people who've been investing for many years. And I raise this issue uh, and I sort of encourage you to do the calculation and sort of expect, I think I know what the answer is. And most of you would probably not be outperforming it. And I think that may be useful information for yourselves. And I'm certainly not here to sell anyone any S&P 500 index fund. I don't sell anything. I'm not a broker, I don't earn commissions. I'm just an academic who teaches students. But I, I think this is a worthwhile thought uh, for each of you. So that I sort of throw that out to each of you. None of you, anyone who wants to respond, please do. I don't, I don't ask anyone to respond. You may if you wish. And then I'm gonna throw this open. And if you have any questions for me whatsoever, uh, please ask now. I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Ethan, you're muted. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. We, that was great. That was really great. We're going to throw it out for um, question and answer. And uh, David's asked that you turn your camera on if you have a question. And I wanted to know that um, in the beginning of the uh, chat, if you look, I, uh, David has said, if anyone thinks of questions in the next few days and wants to contact him, he's graciously offered his personal email address. And he'd rather use that than his University of Maryland email address. Uh, the University of Maryland email address is for official University of Maryland business. So he's given us his private email address. I put it in the chat at the very, if you scroll up in the chat, you'll see it. Uh, as, as, uh, as well as our YouTube channel. So um, does anyone have a question? They, um, I have some questions I had sent you by email, but we'll let other people go first, depending on the time. So does anyone have a question they'd like to ask or? I have a question. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Kyle. What are some good, uh, investment books that you recommend to your students to read that you can share with us? Thank you. Oh, okay. No, that's that's a good question. Um, yeah, one, uh, Warren Buffett um, has um, certainly recommended um, a basic investment uh, book by Ben, ben Graham, sort of his, uh, his hero. Uh, the story with Warren Buffett, just a little bit of history. Um, Warren Buffett attended Columbia, um, got, got a master's degree there, and his professors there are Graham and Dodd, who uh, then at that time co-authored um, uh, uh, the, the major textbook on investing, which was like a Bible, but it's very, very complex. I wouldn't recommend that for anyone. But uh, I actually, my answer to you, I mean, there's a book by Ben Graham, something uh, I, I don't recall the exact title now. If you Google Ben Graham, uh, it's a best selling book. Uh, basically, he talks about uh, investing for the long term, he talks about Martin, you should value a company, only invest in a company if there's a margin for safety. Uh, no, you think it's worth $100. Uh, 
don't pay more than 80, that type of argument. Uh, he may talk a little bit about uh, having a moat or something around uh, 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 the business. But what I would recommend, and others have actually recommended this as well, to me, the best textbook that I would recommend, and it's all it's free, to go to BerkshireHathaway.com, Warren Buffett's letter to shareholders each year it averages maybe 15 to 20 pages. And he says he writes it so his sister, who's not a finance person, could understand it. So it's written uh, for the average person who has an interest in, in what's going on. And he explains not just uh, the business uh, businesses that Berkshire is in, but the overall economy, the interaction with interest rates uh, and valuation. And I think of each uh, report of say 15, 20 pages as being a chapter in a book. And he goes back uh, what's available for free um, online, certainly at least the last 30 years or so, that's all available there. It's very readable, uh, again, written for his sister. Uh, and there's a lot of humor, he's very funny. He throws in jokes left and right, so you won't get bored reading it. And it, it, that, that would be the one book. And you know, there are certain textbooks that we may use. I don't teach an investments course at Maryland, though I did when I first started there some years ago. I'm, I teach sort of a corporate finance class now for undergraduates. Um, but, but those books might be very, they're very technical. Uh, for students have to you know, derive or apply the capital asset pricing model. Although a lot of from your earlier introductory discussion, a lot of you, I think, are very advanced and sophisticated and probably know much about uh, what's in these books anyway and, and more. Um, but I would uh, truly recommend the Warren Buffett letters is more, better than any book that I uh, know of. Okay, that's great, great answer. Um, let's see, Archana, did you wanna ask your question? Uh, directly. Are you there? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I, I was just curious. It's like, you know, how would you advise in cases like, you know, long term investors were wanting to uh, indulge in day trading? It's like, you know, make uh, what percentage should it be of their portfolio? In day trading. OK, here. All right, again, I want to emphasize that each of us has our own unique degree of risk aversion. Yeah. And so I don't have my, I know what's right for me. And I know how Warren Buffett thinks for himself. He always talks about it. And many, when I go to the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, let me just tell you, it's unlike any other corporation annual meeting, it attracts 40,000 shareholders, 40,000. And uh, they, they, he calls it the Woodstock for capitalists or something like that. And the people there think in similar fashion to what I've articulated tonight and the way I think uh, along of being long-term investors. But even among my friends, I have some friends who love Buffett. They own some Berkshire stock. And even then, they put aside a little, say, speculative account that they like to uh, uh, trade, let's say, for themselves. And uh, you know, I I would say I have no answer for you. Um, it's what you feel, what you feel comfortable that you want. Again, I, I can see again if you've done it in the past, it's been profitable. You enjoy doing it. And I've heard some of my friends use the word entertainment. Um, it's something that you do. It's natural. And maybe you you would feel worse off if you stopped doing it. Now, each of us is very different. And I can only tell you the way I think for myself. Um, again, I don't trade. And, eat, you know, and I don't think I have any personal expertise. I think market time, Warren Buffett has said and many others, I think is extremely difficult to um, time the market um, consistently well. I mean, someone can get lucky 
or be good at it for a short period of time. But uh, I'm not aware of anyone who's really good at it over a long period of time. Maybe you folks know people like that. I don't. Uh, and if there is someone like that, that person should be on CNBC, should be a guest there. Uh, I think uh, there'd be a large audience who'd be interested in watching or listening to that person. I think it's extreme. There are so many random events going on, not only in, in economics, politically, you, know, you get an external shock, something happens uh, in Asia, in Europe, the weather, a uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, there are so many uh, unpredictable events that can have a major influence on the stock price movements and psychology. You know, many of you mentioned you do fundamental analysis, probably technical analysis, but there's also an enormous amount of psychology, a totally different field. Psychology that uh, plays into how markets perform and momentum type thing. And, and you who have done trading and probably know a lot more about this than I do, or have more experience with it. Um, all I could do is talk about from my perspective. So I, I would not uh, discourage anyone from what you're doing. And I cannot, uh, I'm not the right person to ask of what might be an optimal percentage of your portfolio that to devote for day trading. I just say that from my point of general advice in that area, I mean, maybe this is too general is whatever you're say having a day trading account is money that you can afford to lose. Uh, or it's money that you must have, that you must have to live on for your retirement, for your children's education, saving to buy a house. I think you'd want to put that into a safer, more stable investment. But money that you feel um, you're willing to take greater risk, there is a trade-off in finance between risk and return. And, and is, uh, you're taking more risk and it should be a higher expected return. Uh, and so there is that uh, trade-off. Uh, so I don't really have a specific answer for you. Sure, thank you. Thanks, yeah. All right, uh, Kirthi, do you want to read your question that you posted in the chat or? Yeah, um, uh, hi, uh, hi uh, David Cass. Like, uh, so I, my quick question is like, um, does it, the current makeup of the market is much different than what it was in 50s or 80s in the older time periods. Uh, right now, the market is made up of big cap tech, which are not leveraged or, or healthcare or staples. They're all cash rich and all the banks make money from uh, interest rates. So do you think the rates have the same impact now? the same as like before interest interest rates having the same impact yeah yeah it i, I think it is different now or, or that's what my understand you know my yeah, perception no, I, is no i think the relationship is uh, pretty stable uh certainly the the big uh, uh tech stocks you know the five largest ones now, by market cap now, of course, are Apple is first, uh, Microsoft second, uh, Alphabet third, uh, Amazon fourth, and NVIDIA is now fifth. And in the so-called Super 7 or Magnificent 7, you throw in Tesla, Meta, former uh, Facebook uh, gets in there. Uh, that if you think of... Uh, now, what I teach my students in finance is two different methods of valuing equities that I'm sure most of you or many of you are familiar with. One is discounted cash flow analysis, and the other is called comparable multiples, which I'm putting aside for now. But discounted cash flow analysis, what we teach our students, is you, you project future cash flows in future years, and you we teach our students to discount them by the weighted average cost of capital. As interest rates go up, the weighted average cost of capital would go up because the debt component uh, of that company, so assuming they have some debt on their balance sheet, uh, goes up. And it's a higher discount 
rate, which means future projected earnings or the present value of future cash flows will be less. So your valuation would go down. And keep in mind the large tech stocks that we're talking about now have these they fairly high, I think their average price earnings ratio may be in the low 30s of the top five or seven. The mark, overall market may be, the S&P 500 without them may have an average projected price earnings rate, I think it's 17. Remember historically, the average between 15 and 16, and if you subtract the top seven or so, the rest of the S&P 500 uh, may have a projected price earnings rate of 17, a little bit above average, but not a lot. Um, but if you raise interest rates, then the rapidly growing companies certainly should go down in value because they're being valued by their future growth primarily. So I would expect th that to bring the market down as well as everything else. Everything else is being discounted by a higher discount rate. So I think this historical relation between interest rates and equities holds up. That's yes, today or recent years, it's the high tech stocks that are driving the market. And previous years, it may have been energy, uh, healthcare stocks in earlier years, other industries. There is a rotation over time. But I think the, the general, again, I my thesis is that the primary determinant of stock prices over time, over short periods of time, uh, are interest rates. And indeed, if we look at what happened to the stock market in 2022, once the Federal Reserve started raising the Federal funds rate from zero, going up to 5% earlier this year, uh, stocks went down. Uh, that we had zero, we had free money for many years. It was very easy, you know, to borrow money at zero percent, one percent, and earn a rate of return. If you earn a rate of return at two percent, you're ahead. Um, so the money was out there. Now, as interest rates uh, go back up, uh, you know, you might think of it as a hurdle rate. What, what do I? We ideally corporations should target earning. Uh, a rate of return on capital that exceeds so their cost of capital, rate of return on invested capital exceeding their weighted average cost of capital. And as that cost goes up, um, you know, it, it just becomes a hot, hot, harder uh, to achieve. Thanks. You're welcome. Great answer. Uh, do we have anyone else? Angel, you want to ask your question? It's like my question. I'd say go ahead and ask your question. I think it relates similar to my questions. I didn't want to hog it. I, I sent David, Dr. Koss, uh, five questions before the meeting. I was thinking of things. Well, the one first question I have is, um, why is the S&P, how did this come about that the S&P 500 index is used as the key index, the key benchmark. Why, for example, are they not using the Dow or the NASDAQ? How did that come about? I've always wondered that. Okay, the answer to that uh, is because it's a very broad index of five, the 500 largest corporations by market capitalization. It's a market capitalization weighted index. The Dow Jones 30 industrials it's just 30 industrials, and it's a price-weighted index. So stocks that are trading for $100 a share, $200 a share, get a lot more weight in the index than a, a company trading at $25 a share, which sort of can distort uh, the index, and it's less representative of the whole economy. Indeed, when I was growing up, uh, So I'll say, certainly back in the 1960s, uh, when I listened to the financial news at night, I got the, the, it was the Dow Jones Industrial Average that was reported every night, not the S&P 500. That didn't come along till later. The S, by the way, the, the history of these indexes is, is interesting. The Dow Jones Average was initiated in 1896, and I believe there were only 12 companies in it. Uh, and expanded over time to 30. The S&P 500 index wasn't started 
until 1957, which may explain why it took several years before it caught on. The NASDAQ index wasn't started until 1971, and it was an index of just NASDAQ listed issues. And NASDAQ listed issues at that time over time tended to be younger, riskier, more rapidly growing companies, more likely to be a technology index. And over time, until recent years, actually, as I recall, their standards uh, for being listed on NASDAQ were a lot lower than the standards to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And there is a New York Stock Exchange index as well that used to be mentioned a lot in the news and now is virtually ignored. So the S&P 500 index has become um, sort of the target, the benchmark, uh, the gold standard of a comparison for large corporations. Now, let me say this, that if you're a portfolio manager and you're managing uh, small stocks, uh, then your benchmark probably would be something other than the S&P 500. You would want to look at Russell 2000, some, some index that focuses on small stocks to see how you're doing against your comparison group. Um, the reason I use the S&P 500 is my favorite comparison is everyone sort of knows about it. It's accessible to everyone. It's easy to understand. And, um, and again, it's done so well. Uh, this year, by the way, uh, last year, the S&P 500 with dividends was down 18% or so. This year, um, through it's only we're halfway through the year, it's already up something like 17%, almost a, a mirror image, almost an inverse of what happened last year. Uh, and again, this average 10% a year with dividends included going back 100 years is just overwhelming. And uh, to me, it is just an overwhelming argument uh, uh, as being something that I think investors should at least consider. Okay, let me ask you another one. Um, this is something that gets referenced online a lot that gets me a little confused. <laughs> so if a fund manager buys a million shares of the S&P, are they buying... What is happening when that happens? Are they buying some entity called, you know, the S and P index, or are they really buying um, shares in the 500 stocks and amounts per the weightings? Yeah, the um, you know some funds uh, sort of it's sort of uh, you can have something like uh, an open-ended fund where the company is actually uh, running the fund is actually obligated to have the money invested in a fund distributed across the 500 components of the fund in their precise weight. So uh, for example, if um, Apple right now is something like seven or 8% of the S&P 500, and I think the, um, the, top 10, the top seven or 10 stocks and the S&P 500 represent 28% of the total weight, uh, they are in their index, in their fund, uh, in the Vanguard fund. If you're buying shares in an S&P 500 index fund, say through Vanguard or, or Fidelity, by the way, I'm, I'm not just partial to Vanguard, it could be any other large brokerage firm. Uh, I'm assuming it's low cost in terms of fees that they charge. Um, that they are obligated to basically invest that money in proportion uh, to the stocks in that index and then calculate that index uh, at night or continuously, I guess. Of course, you have an ETF that trades throughout the day by supply and demand. I see. Okay, I finally understand it. Does, uh, before I ask another one, does anyone else have questions? I want to give... Yeah, Ron, can I, can oh, I ask John? John? Yeah, John, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Dr. Kess. Um, I, I think you sort of mentioned, you kind of alluded to it about the higher um, interest rate, the weighted average cost of capital and things like that. I think I recently saw, um, I think it's a quote from Warren Buffett that he, he was kind of lamenting that the era of prosperous investing 
maybe coming to an end. And I think it was kind of related to your interest rate chart where the, uh, the uh, rate of interest is inversely related to the asset prices. So over the last 40 years, we've had um, declining interest rates. And then now it's gone down to zero. You would assume it's not going to go below zero, although I know some some, some um, central banks have gone below zero. But now I, it, it kind of looks like maybe the interest rates have bottomed out and it's not going to go any lower. So now we're probably looking at an era of stable or perhaps higher um, interest rates, which would raise again the weighted average cost of capital and kind of the valuation metric um, challenges. So would you expect the um, S&P 500 to continue to return 10% or whatever it was on the table you showed when we're now in a different era where the interest rates are not going to be that favorable for asset prices? Just kind yeah. of wondering what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, well, um... Actually, looking at other Federal Reserve tightening cycles that preceded every recession we've had since World War II, interest rates were higher, a lot higher as a starting point and certainly as an ending point. And certainly with Paul Volcker, he pushed interest rates up to double digit area for short term and long term. Um, now, again, looking at these projections that I mentioned earlier, in the Federal Reserve and some of the, the charts that I posted in the slides, interest rates are trending down over time. And uh, you know, the federal funds rate, again, the Federal Reserve projecting, as I mentioned earlier, 5.6%, um, that's five and a half to five and three quarters this year for federal funds and uh, 4.6 4 next year, 3.4 the year after 2.5. Uh, along the run, they are projecting interest rates coming down, which should be favorable uh, for investment. It, it should reduce the weighted average cost of capital, at least the cost of debt uh, component. Our corporate profits, I think our economy is still strong. Um, I'm of the camp, and I raised earlier, many have been concerned about, uh, will we have a recession uh, this year, next year? And if we do, how severe will it be? I'm in the camp saying if we do have a recession, I think we could avoid it, then it'll be very mild. It won't be one of these severe recessions that we've had in the past. And the Federal Reserve could just reverse direction and things look like they were getting worse faster than they expected. They could just cut rates sooner. They could, there's a trade-off clearly uh, uh, between uh, their, their mandate is maximum employment and price stability. And right now, you know, our unemployment rate is at 3.6%. Um, the historic, the lowest it's been is like 3.4, 3.5 in decades. I think mean, going back to 1950 or so, uh, the unemployment rate has not been any lower than 3.4, 3.0, we're at 3.6. Uh, it's hardly a signal of a recession in my opinion. Uh, now, higher, there is a lag with monetary policy. I mean, economists will say you got to wait a year to see the impact of higher interest rates on the economy. There's certainly some empirical support for that argument. But, you know, it's been, um, we are waiting. Uh, it's, uh, it's been over a year since interest rates started moving up. And of course, they haven't had the full effect yet of a year at 5%, might say. Uh, the, I'm not saying there's, we definitely won't have a recession, but I, I think if we do, it'll be fairly mild. Now, I have a couple of my colleagues at the University of Maryland, the finance department, who are highly regarded, widely quoted, and um, they wrote up a little piece a couple of months ago, and they were expecting a severe recession. And at the time, I wrote something short, something I published within the university, within the business school, uh, calling for expecting a very mild recession, if, if we have one at all. And a very no. short-term-ish. And I think Warren Buffett was looking at 20, 30, 40 years down the line. And so when, when you see interest rates dropping from double digit 15% down to whatever, 2 or 3%, so it's hard to see it dropping any more than this 
over the next 20 or 30 years, most likely the trend of interest rates are going to be either higher or stable. So, so that's a different kind of environment than what we've seen over the last 40 years. So with, with, in that kind of environment with, with um, S&P 500 still generate 10% annual returns when interest rates are no longer coming down and floating up the asset prices. I think that was okay. the context that Warren Buffett- well, Remember, interest rates- Environment. No, your question is good. Now, interest rates have come down sharply from 1982 uh, to 2022. Absolutely. And that will drive the market sharply higher over those 40 years. No question about it. But if you look, those are 40 years. I'm talking about 100 years. Uh, going, going back 100 years before 1982. Pre-82, if you look back at uh, this data, uh, it, it still shows the S&P 500 maybe compounding a 9%. And even the numbers, uh, well, it depends on what time period. Basically, there have been various studies. Again, Roger Ibbotson uh, at Chicago and Yale um, and others. Uh, uh, Jeremy Siegel at the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School have shown, have published, published similar results uh, that the basically S&P 500, the dividends included, have grown at nine to 10% a year for a hundred. In fact, some of their studies have gone back 200 years and they show similar results. So I, I to answer your question, uh, even though there's an old expression that past performance cannot be used to predict future outcomes. That's a true statement. Uh, but I think that uh, the mechanism is in place that what has occurred over the last hundred years uh, is likely to recur. Now things, something, things could change dramatically in the future. Uh, right now, of course, on the horizon, uh, uh, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, what will that do? Uh, many argue that uh, that could substantially produce pro uh, increase increase productivity. If productivity gets increased to a large extent, that should be beneficial for corporate profits. Uh, should be beneficial for stocks. That could be a positive impact going forward. I think low, relatively low interest rates is a pos is a positive. I'd rather have that than high interest rates. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Great. Great discussion. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, Zoe, you have a good question. You want to give your question? Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering how you recommend investing in the S&P. Would you buy it monthly? Um, would you set a recurring investment or would you wait for it to go down one day and then buy it? Like, how do you how do you go about investing in the S&P? Yeah, I would recommend for most people to make regular, uh, say monthly or quarterly investments as uh, funds become available to you to invest. Um, and again, I, I mean, I'm virtually trained uh, or listened to uh, and uh, now again, my hero, as you all know, is Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, value investors. And Warren will say they never, in fact, he says he ignores the economy. He, will, he just values companies and looks long term. My answer to your question would be not to try to time the market. I, I don't claim to be any good at that. Once in a while, I get it right. And, and once in a while, I get it wrong. Uh, uh, and I don't know, person, on a personal level, some of you in the audience here tonight may be very good at it, and I hope you are. But I don't know anyone personally who I've met who consistently, or, or, or more, more times than not, time the market successfully. I don't know a single person. Um, and so my, and you can get lucky once or twice, get it right, and then you may be unlucky. I would recommend uh, sort of dollars, what they call dollar cost averaging. Every month, make a fixed contribution, or or every month, every quarter, as money becomes available to you to invest, 
I would recommend investing in the S&P 500 index fund. That's very important, a low, low fee fund like Vanguard, I think Fidelity and other large brokerage firms, I'm sure also have low fee and other brokerage firms, because I assume this is price competitive. I, I hope the large fee days of very large fees are uh, over, at least for a commodity uh, like a S&P 500 index fund that many can offer. Uh, make sure the fees are very low, competitively low, um, and I think you'll do just fine. That would be my advice for almost everyone. That's really sound advice. I should add to your comment that um, I don't know anyone either I've ever met who can time the market that I wish I did. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Go uh, Gokul has a question. You want to read that out loud or? Sure. Uh, thanks, David. Um, my question is, uh, I know you are a long-term uh, investor. Uh, my question is, what are some sectors you are bullish on for a long term? Um, if you uh, name a few individual stocks, that would be great too, like if, yeah. whatever uh, that you feel. Okay, uh, well, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, this reminds me, and I'll give you my answer soon. Uh, Jeremy Siegel, who's a well-known professor, uh, University of Pennsylvania, he has a book, and every few years he, he updates it with a new edition and it's called Stocks for the Long Run. And I do recommend reading that book, by the way, as a good investment book by Jeremy Siegel, Stocks for the Long Run. And Jeremy Siegel, uh, when he was down here in Washington, I was at a talk uh, present when he was talking. And Jeremy Siegel, so when his first book came out, one of the people in the audience raised his hand, he said, I have a question for you. And the question was, which stocks should we buy for the long run? It's very similar to your question now. And I think Jeremy Siegel had no answer for it, or if he did have an answer, I don't think he gave it um, at that time. Now, my, in general, um, I, uh, my own philosophy, I, generally I don't uh, recommend stocks to anyone um, in part, because in part, I, I, uh, in case I don't want to be responsible for anyone losing money based on my recommendation, and it happens once in a while. Uh, but in general, I closely follow Warren Buffett, and I've been following Buffett for decades. Um, and I closely follow his portfolio. And for example, I mean, I, I do own some shares of Berkshire Hathaway and the B shares sell for like $330 a share, something like that, the last time I looked. And uh, I do own some shares of Apple. Apple represents 50% of Berkshire's equity portfolio. Berkshire um, in, in, uh, has an equity portfolio valued over 300 billion and he started investing in Apple in 2016. That's a fairly recent investment for him. And it placed a big bet on it and it has obviously done well. Uh, so if you, I would recommend uh, again, looking at his letter to shareholders, well, look at a 13F filing. His 13F filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission will show his portfolio, his equity portfolio at the end of the previous quarter. Uh, I would recommend looking at that. Um, and I would say in general that his, uh, you know, right now um, among the stocks that he holds, and indeed there is a small position uh, there and he has two portfolio managers, Ted Weschler and Todd Combs. And together they invest roughly 10% of the portfolio and they're, they've been there for 10 years. And the reason they were hired is that when Warren Buffett is no longer there, they, they would take over the portfolio. And someone else named Greg Abel has been named to succeed Buffett as CEO. And Greg Abel runs all their business, most of their businesses other than insurance. Um, so if you look at their 13F, which is publicly available, 
uh, for example, every quarter. Um, uh, you'll see um, stocks that I probably would like as well. So in general, I don't really make recommendations. I do like Berkshire. I do like Apple. And I like the S&P 500 index. I do like uh, right now, uh, certainly um, you know, the, uh, the top five um, uh, by market cap. Although I don't know, NVIDIA, which is now number five, I have no opinion as to whether or not that might be overvalued. I, I'm not a, an expert on semiconductor chips or anything like that. I, I, I have no insight into that. Um, but I, I would think the outlook uh, for those companies in the top five that I mentioned before would be quite good. Great. Uh, anyone else? I think we're just about done. Rob, do you have a, since you're the uh, founder of the group, do you have any questions you'd like to ask her? Um, hey, I, I don't. I found it a fascinating presentation, though. I'm like, you know, it, it, this is kind of the stuff you know, but you forget. You know, it's easy. It's easy to forget how uh, how well you can do not doing anything. You know, just uh, just you know, it's it's really long term, um, and uh, you know, I I feel bad for people who take this approach who you know got in in two thousand expecting you know big big things, but if you know if you got in twenty ten or 1980, as everybody mentioned, it's it's just fabulous. Um, and I really wanted to thank uh, Dr. Cassett. This was really fabulous. Really enjoyed this. Well, that was thank great. You. Yeah, no, I thank you uh, for your comments. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. It was really great. I, I enjoyed it tremendously. And a couple people left, and they thank you. Uh, does anyone have any other closing comments or uh, that's about it, I guess. All right, well, thank you all for coming and thank you, Dr. Cass. Great presentation and uh, you're always welcome back. If you have any updates, okay. we'd love to have you. Okay. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Robert, for your kind comments. Um, thank you all for listening. Good night, all. You're welcome. Good night, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Zoe.